How many out here in the audience consider Spinel their favorite gem? It's quite a lot. Pretty good showing. It's been my favorite gem since uh, I started looking at gems, um, mainly because the inclusions I thought were so interesting, uh, but now also because of the colors and the variety and so forth. So I'm going to go through a little history on Spinel for you first. In the first century, Pliny in his Natural History of the World uh, referred to all red gemstones, garnets, rubies, spinels, as carbuncles. In the 10th century, renowned scholar Abu Ryan al-Biruni refers to the ruby mines of Badakhshan. Al-Biruni was a brilliant, brilliant scholar, and uh, he had, did many, many things besides write about gems, also about natural history and so forth. And the Silk Road, which dates back to the first century, ran right through the region of Badakhshan. The Great Silk Road crossed through Badakhshan and the Pamir Mountains, connecting China to the west. So it was an extremely important trade route, I'm sure you're all familiar with. This is the area that we're talking about. And if you notice, going all the way through and dividing Afghanistan and Tajikistan and Pakistan is the Oxus, or also then becoming the Pamir River. And there's a, a triangle down in the, in the middle on the bottom, and you'll see it says Kui Lal, and that's where the spinels are, that are coming out today are coming from. In the 13th century, Marco Polo reported that fine balas rubies originated from this very region. This is a facsimile of uh, a drawing in his, in his book. So balas ruby refers to rose or pinkish red spinels. Balas, the word balas, is derived from balasya, which is the old name for Badakhshan. And that's the district from which the finest spinels originated and were recovered in medieval times. In the 14th century, the most famous Balas ruby, the Black Prince's ruby, enters into the stage of history in the possession of Abu Said, the Moorish prince of Granada. He's murdered by the Spanish king, Pedro the Cruel, who later passes on the Balas ruby or Spinel, to Edward the Black Prince of Wales for his support during the Civil War and the Battle of Najera. In the 15th century, this gem became even more famous when it was said to have saved the life of King Henry V. He had it set in his helmet, which was struck at the, by the battle axe of the French Duke of Aronson at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. In the 16th and 18th centuries, and in all the time before, spinel and ruby have historically been confused with one another because they're often found in close geological proximity within crystalline limestones or secondary deposits. Sri Lankan and Burmese gem traders began distinguishing spinel from ruby in the mid-1500s but the Europeans did not officially recognize spinel until the mid-1700s. The word spinel most likely is derived from the Greek words spina, meaning thorn, because the crystals look like little thorns, or spinther, and or spinther, which means spark, referring to the burning amber red color of most of the spinels that were seen during that time. The Black Prince's ruby and the Imperial State Crown is arguably the most famous of all these spinels. It's 170 carats, and it has a drill hole right through the middle of it. So the top of the drill hole is capped with none other than a small cabochon ruby, which you see here in the picture. There you can see a profile drawing of what it looks like. Now, back to the 14th century again the 361 carat Timur ruby comes to the stage. And Timur 
or Tamerlane, is still revered as one of the greatest conquerors of all time, albeit very cruel, and, uh, but in, in that time that was normal. He served under Genghis Khan, and later he built canals and dams and diverted the rivers in the Pamir Mountains, which likely obtained, where he likely obtained the famous Timur Ruby, which is pictured here. Now there are many other crown jewel collections in which we see these enormous spinels uh, that have always been called rubies. The Sheikh of Sabah collection, which has over 50 royally inscribed spinels, records the many Mughal rulers and the history of their ownership. The one on the left you see there is a 249 carat inscribed spinel. And the Mughal emperor Shahan Jahan, Shah Jahan ruled from 1628 to 1658, and he had many of these spinels in his possession. He also happens to be the one who built the, the Taj Mahal. The crown jewels of Iran also have many of these large spinels. This necklace has approximately 2,000 carats of these spinels. The one on the left is 500 carats. It's known as the Sumerian spinel. And an inscription on the back confirms the famous Indian Mughal and gem collector, Jehangir Shah, who once owned that gem. It was later taken from India in the early 1700s during the Afsharid conquest. So more Iranian crown jewels. Amazing. This crown is known as the Kiani crown, and it features over 1,800 rubies and spinels, and the largest spinel is 120 carats. The Russian crown jewels has the Catherine the Great ruby mounted at the top of the crown. And this 398 carat ruby spinel was made for Catherine's coronation in 1762 and is the lar second largest known gem spinel. So, now to today. Today, spinels come in many more colors, much more diverse, and we see them being used in all sorts of jewelry and coming from all sorts of different origins, primarily because their durability, their clarity, and high dispersion create a great allure for customers. So I'm going to take you on a virtual tour to some of the sources. Many of you know what they are, but I'll just give you some examples so to refresh your memory about the importance of spinel in the marketplace today. Mogok and Nanyasek, or Namya as it's called, were the primary sources for red spinels in the 20th century. The British occupied Mogok in the late 1800s. And as a result, a lot of uh, more mining happened than in the past. But also, unfortunately, the, uh, the royal families were then exiled. This is the last king and queen of Burma that were exiled to India. Now, you can see all the very large uh, crystals that were being bestowed upon them. And I would imagine that many of them were probably large spinels. This is a 42 karat Burmese spinel that I was able to buy back in the early 90s. So they do exist, very large spinels do exist in Burma as well. And of course there's the Enchanted Valley of Mogok, which now has become more open and I hope that many of you get to go visit. It's a wonderful place. They have primary deposits of spinel there that artisanal miners can, can mine and by hammering right out of the dolomitic limestone marbles. And this is kind of what you come up with. So large spinel conglomerates like the one in the center smaller octahedrons like the one on the left and the one in the calcite dolomitic uh, marble. The typical uh, spinel morphology is obviously octahedral, but sometimes also you see these twinned mackles. Some of them, like in the one in the middle, are just normal mackles, and then you have the one at the bottom which is truncated. Uh, that's typically what you see. And if you're lucky enough to get some super fine ones, then they come out as nice as this. This is a five carat vivid red from Mogok. Or you could find the neon, also known 
uh, as the Jedi spinels from Nanyasaic or Namya. Uh, the one in the center there is a five carat emerald cut that my grandfather purchased in the 1940s. Uh, Vincent Pardue is the one who has come up with this name that is just taking off and uh, it's, it's an amazingly electric pink color. So there are some diagnostic locality specific inclusions in Burmese spinels. This is a photograph that was taken by my grandfather in, the, in 1980 of rounded protogenetic apatite crystal with black hexagonal ilmenite crystals attached to it. That's something that I haven't seen from any other locality. You can also get corroded protogenetic calcite crystals, uh, not apatite, but calcite crystals that have black hexagonal graphite crystals attached to them. So again, something that I haven't seen from any other locality. That one is a picture that I took back in 1991. This is a typical inclusion scene that you would see in Spinel uh, with the numerous little octahedral negative crystals that have the aureolas around them. And uh, in one of them, there's uh, also a black crystal, which is either ilmenite or graphite, like I showed you before. Now, of course, pastel and many other beautiful spinels come from Sri Lanka, Tanzania, and Vietnam. Here's an 8 carat from Sri Lanka. And here's a 13 carat from Vietnam. Now, Sri Lanka, you all know what the map looks like, so don't have to go into detail there. Obviously, the mining that happens in Sri Lanka is primarily alluvial or secondary, and uh, you get these amazing spinels that are very clean as a result. Some of them do have inclusions, and they have things like the strongly corroded protogenetic apatite spheres that you see on the right in a purple uh, Sri Lankan spinel. This is a 24 carat on the, on the left. The other thing you get in Sri Lanka that's very unique is these star spinels. They tend to be very small, but they have amazing stars, and it's a very, very difficult thing to cut because, as you know, spinel is a cubic material, so it grows cubically, uh, so it's very difficult to figure out where the orientation would be for a star to get a six-ray star. Usually, you just get a four-ray, but this is kind of to show you how that works. So this is from a book that uh, my grandfather wrote in 1968 on the gemstones from the islands of, of Ceylon. Unfortunately, it's only been written in German and never translated, but uh, it's a great book. And uh, here you can see the proper orientation of the six-ray star. You can also see if you just turn it a little bit, you're getting a four-ray on the, some of the corners. And basically, it's just the orientation is perpendicular to the octahedral face of the crystal. Those of you that are here and you, you're going to be going on a mine tour and everything, if you have a chance to go to Berula as well as being here in Colombo, it's a great trading center and you'll see lots of interesting gems from all over the world, um, including lots of spinels. When I'm traveling, looking at stones, I, you know, or getting, giving talks, I try and, and give people some interesting things to look for when they're trying to identify their stones. Uh, these are growth tubes and an apatite crystal within a pink spinel from Sabaragamua in, uh, in Ratnapura. And it's interesting that that picture, unfortunately they're not very focused up there right now, you can't probably see it as well, but that's an inclusion that contains another inclusion. So it's a growth tube within an appetite within a spinel. And all of that was captured with an iPhone looking through a, um, a dark field microscope. You can get very unusual things like uh, pyrotite, which is an iron sulfide. Uh, this is in a, also in a Sri Lankan spinel. Or very rarely you can find something like these rare blade-like bedeliite crystals. They're, it's a zirconium oxide crystal um, in, in a spinel from Rakwana. Or you can find forsterite crystals, an olivine mineral, from a spinel in Kuruwita. And then, of course, there's the new finds in Vietnam, which are amazing, those electric uh, neon colors that you see. But they also have beautiful red spinels coming from the Luc Yen area in northern Vietnam, northwest of Hanoi. The, the mine that's probably most famous for the red and, and lavender colored spinels is called Cong Troi, which means Heaven's Gate. 
It's a very difficult mine to get to, and it's a very steep slope getting up to the top. Those are the tailings you see at the bottom, and the miner, uh, is, that's where his hut is and where they had the, the uh, processing plant, or fat, you know, there's a washing plant there. You can see it on the left. Material coming out of there typically looks like this. These are, they're kind of a little bit more dark red than what you typically see from Burma, but the mode of formation is exactly the same. Just like the rubies from Vietnam, the mode of formation is exactly the same as in Burma. Um, they do look a little bit different. Um, the chromium levels and what have you, iron levels are a little bit different. And you, you typically can see associated with these also orange clinohumite or green pargasite. This crystal looks a little bit weird because it's actually a twinned crystal. Or you can get fine needles along twinning planes, which are possibly bomite or rutile, and also a spinel from Lukien. And then you have the neon blue spinels from Bison, uh, which is just over the hill from, Luk from uh, the, the, the area that we were just at, Kong Troy. Um, these two stones are, are courtesy of Pala International. Um, all right, now we move on to Tanzania. Tanzania uh, was actually the first place that I got to go in the early 1990s. Uh, when I was working for the Gublin Lab to do some research, I went to Morogoro, and I went uh, to Matombo and Mahenge and found light pink colored spinels. They didn't have the beautiful red, vivid reds that we see today. So I was collecting them for the lab, and uh, we'll see a few of them here. This is kind of what they look like. They're, they're kind of a baby pink, and they tend to be uh, somewhat included and have kind of a very soft look to them. These are the typical inclusions that you see. And also the interference colors along polysynthetic twinning planes. That's also typical for that material. Again, it's, it's, it's a indication that it could be from Tanzania. It's not completely typical uh, diagnostic, but it's a very good indicator. And then on the way to Mahenga with uh, my good friend Mark Saul, who's taken many people up there. Um, this is to the original primary dis deposit. Oh, this is what it looks like. Typical octahedral crystal. And something that I always try and share with people, which I think is really fascinating about spinel, and, and you don't, most people don't think about it, but spinel, just like diamond, gold, copper, silver, all these important minerals that we think about and use every day, forms as octahedral crystals. Uh, they're all cubic, so they're within the cubic system, but they, in their perfect state, they form in these beautiful octahedral crystals. So you've got like gold, copper, and of course there's something about that stability that uh, makes them durable and interesting, so like the pyramids, lasting forever. These are some vivid Tanzanian spinels, also from Iponco, just to show you that it's not just the pink that you get from there, you can also get these kind of more purples and lavender colors. Uh, it's a picture of the preforms uh, that, that uh, Robert Weldon put together for me so you can see what they looked like before and after cutting. And then here you have some typical colors, the vivid pinks along with the red. The red one on the bottom right is a 20 carat, so it's very large. And then some typical inclusions. You get calcite and apatite crystals uh, this is in an 18 karat vivid red from Ipanko. Madagascar also produces beautiful spinels. Most of the ones that we see are blues and color changes, but they also have other colors. Um, the mine that's most famous is the Bank, Bank Swiss mine, which is so strange. I, I can see it here on my screen, but you're not getting the picture coming through. <laughs> anyway, um, luckily you get to see the beautiful gems. So this is a 35 karat purple spinel from Ilakaka, one of, the, one of the finest spinels I've ever seen in my life. And then of course Tajikistan and Afghanistan today coming in full circle from where we started in the historical spinels and balas rubies all the way back again to where we're finding them again today in Kuilal. Uh, you can see right there on the border and there's a picture of uh, Vincent. He was on a, uh, this trip that Dick Hughes was with him on as well. Um, and you can see the river running through the middle there, the Pamir River, Oxus River, and Kuilal down in the valley. And Kuilal is next to the, you know, the Pamir River means um, uh, roof to the world. That's what Pamir stands for. So it's kind of a beautiful name. You can see Tajikistan on the right and Afghanistan on the left. 
which again, if we go back to Marco Polo's facsimile, it's kind of very interesting how, how similar that is, isn't it? You can see the miners down in the bottom to the right and then giving gems to, the, to one of the kings. One of the early stones that I saw from the Pamir Mountains dates to prior to when all this new material started coming out. It was in 1991, and it had already been in the marketplace for probably five years. So this, you're talking about mid-'80s that this stone existed from there, um, which is much earlier than when all the new material we've seen recently. You can also get these beautiful baby pink colors. And then you can, the older material, I have some old rough, and this looks exactly like the really old rough. Um, it's, it's much more of a, a, a vibrant pink, but it's also very included, so it's, it's more of a turbid look. But it glows uh, very differently from other spinels from that area. This is uh, probably the finest one that I've seen. Um, it's a 53 carat that belonged to Eddie Gem and was a, a stone owned by Federico Barlucker. This is a picture that he took. Um, there's one here at the show, actually, a 74 carat at uh, Mr. Muslim's booth. If, you're, if, if you have a chance to see it, it's quite spectacular. Um, his booth is the one that's right next to um, Gem Paradise. So if you go up and enter, it's just the left over there. You can see that. Um, 21st century and beyond. Many, many designers today are using spinel. They, they are, it's, it's really come of its own, and you'll see modern designs from designers such as Erica Courtney, who's here uh, in the, I think in the audience, she's definitely here at the, at the Congress visiting. Um, she's one of the early users of spinel. Um, my wife also designed some, some pieces. That's actually a, a Tanzanian spinel. And then, you know, famous designer like de Grossogono using 30 carats of spinel melly. You see it, a lot of spinel mellies being used as an accent stone too because it's so brilliant. So in conclusion, if I don't con convey anything else to you today, this is what I want you to know about spinel. Many of the most famous rubies in all of the royal and religious regalia that we see around the world that's been famous for thousands of years are actually spinels. So, if not for Spinel, Ruby would not have achieved the fame that it enjoys today. So, thank you for your time and attention.